It is uh, very uncomfortable for me to be up here today because the topic I've been asked to talk about. Um, it was a curious request, and my wife told me this morning on the phone, she goes, you've been asked, are you going to show up? So I'm going to show up. What I'm going to offer to you today is it's a personal journey for sure. It's an individual one, but as a, as a brother to you all, as RN reminded us how closely we are connected and related, it's an opportunity that my life has presented at least to inform me about some thoughts and ideas and challenges a lot of my beliefs. And a lot of what I started to teach later in the Ag Leadership Program was critical thinking. And the critical nature of critical thinking that I think often gets missed, because most universities teach it as an argumentation. How do you disassemble someone else's argument or belief structure? And I turned that to say, first seems the responsible approach is, how do I disassemble my thoughts and beliefs? And are they really my thoughts anyway? Or are they infused into me by society, culture, my religion, my background, and became beliefs, but I hadn't explored them to be really ethical within myself, to kind of ask deeper questions. And it seems to me that's a grounding for us with respect to our lives, the impact we intend to make or want to make, and how deeply rooted is that in, in really evaluating and analyzing? Is this me? Is this what I've been created to help serve? And if it is, then I, not, I need to stay true to it the best I can. So my intention definitely, as RN would say, is not to offend anybody today. Please accept my offering simply in a humble way of saying, okay, I've been asked by both Kelly and, and RN to share some global experiences, and this is what helped form my thinking. And we're changing microphones yet again. So, all right, let me turn this one off. And so here, I will say that I, I late in life, acquired a, a PhD in depth psychology, and many of us would call that a soft science. I found my degrees in hard science much easier to write up the research and report than the soft sciences. As a matter of fact, my major advisor, I picked her because I knew she was a tough nut. She regret, rejected my proposal for dissertation six times. It was enough to walk away, except I stayed with it. I knew she was holding me accountable. And to really draw the kinds of conclusions that this dissertation brought forward, sort of created within my own psyche, within my own experiences, within the, the literature, within the world of depth realms, which is the unconscious realm of human existence, of the psyche of the soul, it presented me with a dissertation called Awakening to Ecocide. You know, 60 to 80% of our decisions are made unconsciously. Our ego thinks we're in control, but our egos not only are not in control, so much of our choice is already made before we think we have made that decision. What I saw globally was a decline of the capacity of Earth to sustain life as we were managing it. You know, the first time I was in China in the early 80s, everybody was on a bicycle, and they were either in the gray or green Mao suits. The last time I was in China, the uh, early part of this century, everybody was in an automobile. Is that doable with 1.4 billion, now 1.4 billion in India? Can the planet sustain that? And, you know, I think data shows us, oops, leaves us with a rather major challenge. One of the things, let's see, are we going to be collaborative, cooperative, and technologically capable today? I don't think, yes. I, you know what? I actually thought I had. I apologize for my um, in inabilities here. Um, thank you. One of the things that drives me is I have difficulty sitting and, and feeling like I need to do something. I need to do something. So, you know, as I say, sitting around all day um, is not something I can quite do. I have absolutely failed at retirement. 
uh, I intend to continue to fail at retirement as long as I think I'm productive and can contribute. And where is that? Well, one of, one of the things, change please, can we advance the slide? Gentlemen, thank you. One of the things that I, I've been blessed with is people who've stimulated thoughts in my mind. And in the 80s, I was in Honduras, was been a donor to, to, at that time it was World Vision, not World Vision, World Neighbors. And Roland Bunch was one of the real development people. He'd been a Cal Poly graduate too. And he had written a book called Two Ears of Corn, which was, you know, where there was one ear, now there's two. He's really a developer of human capacity, of leadership, of innovation, of decision making, of experimentation, of storytellers, to help spread development and agricultural development. But he had told me when I was visiting, he said, we can build an inch of topsoil a year here in the tropical agricultural region of Honduras. He said, there's not a textbook in the world that says that's possible. And that changed my perspective of agriculture, my history as a farmer, my history as, as a, a teacher and a scientist. I thought, wow, there isn't a textbook that says you can do that. And I saw how it was being done. I had no reason to question it. And I kind of helped share that word around the world. Well, part of the story that kind of continues is a few years later, part of the, in my county, in San Luis Obispo County, I'm not getting action here, gentlemen. Thank you. Is that we decided, some Kellogg uh, fellows and I, uh, decided to go with one of my neighbors that had helped raise a lot of money for World Neighbors um, to go down and visit not only uh, Roland and what he was doing, but at the time the uh, Contra Sandinista conflict was going on in Nicaragua. And so I said, well, if we're going to go there, let's be sure we go to the embassy and get a briefing. Let's look at the contextual framework, <coughs> excuse me, of how development's trying to move in a country like this. What's the U.S. policy? What's our thinking? Uh, because we've failed so many times. And we went to that briefing, and, and these two buds of mine, Jack Weatherford and, and Ray Gachalian, and I sort of stayed in one Jeep as we kind of traversed the country together. And, and Ray, Ray is now deceased. He was a filmmaker that, when he came back as a Green Beret from Vietnam, became a peace activist. He was a fireman in Oakland. He helped during the earthquake of uh, 89, uh, rescue people from under those collapsed freeways and recover bodies. He really started to focus on child exploitation and making films on that. And he died a very mysterious death in Chile while he was filming these kinds of questions. Jack. Uh, just called me the other day and he said he's moving to Mongolia full time. He's an anthropologist, written a number of books, and I realized I hadn't read his book on Genghis Khan. And on this last trip to Europe, to the Czech Republic and Bulgaria, I, I read the book. Boy, it changed my whole thinking about that. That's a really interesting understanding of how Genghis Khan shaped our life today. And you wouldn't think so because of the impression we've gotten from it. But here we are in this Jeep. We've gotten a briefing from the embassy that told us about those nasty Sandinistas and those Contras we were supporting. And don't you dare, you Americans, go down to the border near Nicaragua. You're not allowed to go there. That's all they had to tell us. So we went. And we found farmers that said, you know, the Contras are raping our women, stealing our farms, taking our, our uh, coffee, taking our grains, and you guys were supporting them. We ran into an NBC News correspondent who was filming down there, and we said, why aren't we getting this story in the US? And they said, we film it, we send it. We don't know why. My wife and I haven't had a television set in over 30 years. <laughs> I've had that kind of information given to me many times around the world. Well, in essence, we were told U.S. is not involved. Our President Reagan said, we're not there. We're driving back, and the U.S. helicopter is flying over the top of us, going, huh. And then there's these hitchhikers. And Roland in a car ahead of us stops and picks up some women. We stop and pick up a couple of men. One man had a San Francisco Giants cap on. He's got to be my buddy. 
and uh, a briefcase. And we were kind of asking him, and both Ray and Jack spoke better Spanish than I did. I was driving, and he said he was a Comerciano. He was selling beans and coffee, which kind of put my antenna up. We let him off in Don Lee. We stopped at a stop sign that they wanted to get out at, and there was a blonde-haired, blue-eyed, Levi-wearing American standing on the corner who saw us, and his eyes got about that big. He said, we're into something here we don't know about. As we left, we got out of town, and Roland had pulled over and said, do you know who you had in your car? We go, we know we had somebody who wasn't who he said he was, but no. He said, you had Enrique Bermudez, contra leader. They were just collecting here in Don Lee for a meeting with the CIA. I go, oh. A few years later, Enrique Bermudez was assassinated. Maybe that's why the embassy didn't want us to go down there, but it was a situation of, again, critically thinking and asking questions. What's our responsibility? What can we do? I had a good friend, a Republican congressman from Southern California, who he'd call me on occasion. I never got the chance to ask him, but he had been indoctrinated by top-down policy, not bottom-up. One of the beauties about what we're doing here is this is bottom-up. This is a farmer-led movement making dramatic change. And that's why I'm so supportive and pleased to be in a process like this. Because it starts to incentivize innovation and it starts to make change from the grassroots up. And that can't be stopped. And that's what I think is really beautiful. Next slide. Anyway, I'm on the board of Groundswell International. I'll bring that up a little bit later. Next slide, please. Let's jump to Africa a minute. So, I've been to 97 countries some many times over the course of years, it's shaped my thinking and thoughts in many, many ways. Burundi, who knows where it is? Americans and our geography. Nobody? One of the four poorest countries in the world. 90% agrarian based. They're all our brothers and sisters in farming. Uh, it's in Africa, it's right near Rwanda, so that narrows it down, right? Which is, of course, near Uganda, which is not far from Tanzania. Anyway, that's where it is. So Howard had sent us in there to kind of take a look at the potential of an idea to really put some investment money in, agri in, agri in agricultural development. Next slide, please. The culture's amazing, it's interesting has a pretty curious history. Next slide. But I got invited back. I said, Howard, can I go back? They want to do some work on this no-till. They want to do some work on trying to figure this out. And so we collected a group of ministers and past ministers, a group of, of some farmers of the Catholic Church was about 90% of them were Catholic and they, the diocese had land so we could mobilize that for training. We could bring people in and have videos and trainings on how to shift their farming practices. We were really developing a pretty good concept, we thought. In essence, we ran a three-day strategic planning session and I had a French translator who was translating to this group that we had actually randomized. So ministers sat with farmers, which culturally never happened there before. And Minister said, well, we'll try this American way. It actually worked very effectively for them. But when I'm presenting to them, I was saying to you Burundians, what is it that you love about Egyptians so much? And they looked at me confused. Translator was translating. I was watching the interaction. And then I put up this slide. I said, you are sending your primary resource down your river, the Blue Nile, and dumping it in the Aswan Dam every day. 100% of their agriculture was tilled. Next slide. Their colleges taught it. Next slide. The soil was bare. And what are those rains going to do? Their biodiversity was decimated. We saw one monkey and almost no birds in this whole country because of this agricultural process that is pretty widespread in Africa as an example. 
An agronomist that was traveling with us, I said, you know, we have to work on how we turn your soils black. And she goes, what? And I kept talking to her about it day and day. And one day she comes back to me and she goes, you mean like this? And she'd gone over, she'd been listening to me under a woman who had stacked a bunch of banana leaves on, on, on a corner of her land and she dug underneath it and she got black soil. And I go, yes, like that. That's what we're looking to do along with changing this tillage equation as well. Next slide. Here's some markets, just, of course, this is the way food is marketed, sold, traded uh, in local markets. This is a really crucial to the economies, local economies that need to be built. Next slide. And next. Also, community lending groups is really important. Sometimes we think, well, people need to help themselves. With a little bit of help and training, they do. And in their own lending groups, whether it's their own money that they lend to each other, it's paltry amounts that can make huge personal differences for their businesses, for their agriculture, for their small enterprises that they try and get going. And it's part of efforts that I've worked with when I was at the Savory Center, we worked with with Groundswell. I, I work with, with a colleague of mine, we'll be in Guatemala in, in next month on some projects he's been doing there with empowering small, uh, smallholder, not smallholder, small business women uh, that make tremendous differences, of giving small amounts to really make huge differences and some training, training of accounting, training of how they can actually increase their wealth. Next slide. You see lots of pictures of my wife in here, but you know, sometimes we think about the challenges we have farming. That's a challenge. But when the land's needed, and you have to feed your family, you start to climb the hills. There's no question about that. Next slide. So Burundi was tough. Burundi had the genocide that Rwanda had, the Hutus and Tutsis. You, you talk about trying to break through and get to some common understandings. You and I couldn't tell the difference between a Hutu and a Tutsi, if we saw them on the street. And they were macheting each other to death. Talk about hatred and division. It's hard to be in the presence of that. We had to be careful that we'd never use those two terms about the tribal identifications while we were there, just because of what it would bring forward. You know, it was sad in a lot of ways we didn't make, a, Howard didn't make investment in Burundi. I thought we were going to make really good progress. I think Howard knew something I didn't know. And he would often, because of his potential of bringing money into an, a situation, uh, would be wined and dined by presidents. And he told me, the president took him in his personal helicopter around Burundi. Howard ended up making a $500 million development investment in Rwanda, the neighboring country. More stable scenario, a little bit less corrupt president. And that project seems to be doing all right. So Burundi remains, certainly, even with development going on, a struggling effort in, in human development, in food security, uh, in stable governments uh, as we exist today, as they exist today. Next slide. Let me jump then out of off Africa to Peru. So over the years, I've been to Peru maybe five or six times, way back in the 70s till this, I think, was 2015. Peru now, you know, is in an unstable scenario. It is at risk of falling apart from a governmental standpoint. Um, that's a challenge. I have a friend who's a bean trader, literally. And he's now he was telling me about the, these projects he has going in Peru. And those kind of businesses are going to implode along the same line. But I was going there because I was assisting a woman working with the UN on black carbon. And black carbon is a challenge from a climate change standpoint because when black carbon ends up on snow, it speeds up the melting. It's a, it's a climate forcer. So we're melting our glaciers around the world with our excesses of emissions, but now add dark black sun absorbing heat and you melt them faster. And there were two regions that I was helping her with. One was in India 
in the Punjab where farmers were burning rice straw. And a lot of that soot ended up on the glaciers in the Himalayas. In Wankayo, I flew in, landed at 10,000 feet. I said, this should be okay, I think. But I'll go to the hotel and kind of rest. And I go, no, I'm doing good at 10,000 feet. I can go out and kind of start to meet with the farmers and start to talk about how do we change agricultural practices to get away from burning of their crop residue. These farmers knew they were destroying their water sources. What did you just say this morning? These farmers knew they were destroying their water sources. We know in California, we're destroying our water sources. We know climate. I just read an article this morning. We have 30 foot of snow in the Sierras. That used to be our reservoir. It's going to melt way too fast this year. And you're going to, we're going to lose our reservoir capacity being held on the mountains. So, again, we're destroying our water sources. They know they're doing this. And it's, they, they're motivated to change. It's a matter of the difficulty of mindset to change the way we've done things. And how do we incentivize that? And how do we make that change? This is quinoa that they're growing, and that's part of the big problem because they burn that residue in the field. You know, it's interesting. Quinoa, they saw as a poor man's food. And they really didn't want anything to do with it until Americans started to eat it. And then it became kind of a pretty classy food. And now they grow it a lot and export it and sell it and eat it because it's valued somewhere else. But it is a problem ecologically. Next slide. The Quinoa Research Center was interesting to me. This is not a crop I had much experience with. And next slide, please. But here's where we get the black particle and that burning ending up on their glaciers. There are millions of people in this world that depend on glacier water for drinking water, supporting cities, and agriculture. Next slide. They wanted to take me up to the glaciers, their glacier, the one that fed their valley, their farming. So I went up, I'm at 10,000 feet doing just fine, and the glacier used to cover everything where I'm standing here, clear on out and down farther. And now it has diminished to where there's really no glacier left. That's where we are already. Lima is going, is going to be in a serious scenario with regard to water supplies as a major city of the world. There are many cities in the Andes and in the Himalayas that are in the same predicament and scenario. So mass migration disruption of, of civilization, this is one of the climate factors that's coming forward for us, humanity on a global scale. There I was standing 2,000 feet higher, and I said to the driver, where did the oxygen go? I was doing fine at 10,000 feet. I was saying, can we go down now? I was having trouble breathing. It reminded me, once my wife and I landed in Tibet, and we're at that 10, 12,000 feet, 12,000 feet level. We get into the hotel. They give us our room key. And I go, good. So where's the elevator? They go, well, the elevator's broken. You're on the third floor. You can take the stairs. That was a mountain to climb at 12,000 feet. Took a while. Got up, went to bed. They said, if you have an oxygen problem, come down. We'll give you an oxygen supply. I thought, well, let's see how we do. We laid down, went to sleep, and you'd wake up startled because you couldn't get enough oxygen. So I went down the stairs thinking, oh, God, I've got to climb these stairs again. I said, we need some oxygen. Can you give it to us? And they said, sure. They filled up an inner tube and sent us back up with an inner tube that we needed to suck on at night to try and get enough oxygen uh, in our lungs to try and sleep through the night and make this adjustment. So um, these cultures amaze me. I know they're adjusted, they're adapted. Um, but it's interesting how such a minor change is a tipping point in our physiology to be able to function. So, next slide. So now I'm going to jump to Kenya. A couple years ago, I was invited to speak in Rwanda for sort of a Northeast Central African conference by a Christian organization called ECHO, and was really talking about inoculants and talking about uh, regenerative agriculture. 
and I have some Kenyan friends that wanted us to come into Kenya, and they had a research center, and we were doing some collaborative conversations with them. And the director said, let's go down, and I want to show you this, this woman, this farmer. And so we went down, and here's this woman. She's a couple hectares at most. She's happy. She has a reason to be happy. What an example, please, of regenerative agriculture. Diverse plantings, robust fields. They knew the other farmers in Kenya didn't have this to show. She figured out this multi-species, multi-planting, how biologically that was going to help. She couldn't talk to you about the biology, but how that really gave her a productive system. Next slide. Whereas the research center, still planting monospecies crops, calling this cover crops, wasn't as robust. That's our old way of thinking. It's our old way of understanding how we're going to farm. Next slide. She had two cows, and my wife's taking a picture there with her iPad, but that's a manure collector homemade biodigester that she built. Next slide. And there's the trap gas that she pipes into her kitchen in the new house she built. That's her husband there who had a government job. In her whole, her whole life, she had to ask her husband for money. Now he comes to her for money because of this complex, productive agricultural system that's not only providing them food, but she has food to sell. She stores her corn in her house. She keeps the aflatoxins away. She doesn't let it get wet. She knows what she's doing. And as I said, it's one of the happiest people I've ever seen. She's succeeding in a biodiverse, ecologically sound, more than sustainable, regenerative, self-fertilizing system and up the well-being of her family, her children, and her husband. Next slide. Contrast. Blythe, California. The farmer we're working with there on that major research project we have going, he finally sold this plow. That is an eight-foot plow. Why would you need an eight-foot plow? Because as the agronomist told him, the reason your yields have declined over the years, even though you're applying more fertilizer, is your soil's wearing out, and we've got to go down and bring those nutrients up to the surface. That's extractive chemical farming, trying to get the nutrients and bring them up to the surface. It took him two years for that ground to recover. It took 1,000 horsepower to pull it, two 500 horsepower John Deere's in tandem. And he proudly told me the other day, he said, Tim, I sold the plow. <laughs> and I said, well, good, I hope so. He said, you know what, I've, I've sold a lot of my tractors too. You know, I don't need all that horsepower anymore. I don't need all that fuel anymore. He said, I would work every year. And he has a, a very successful 12,000 acre hay farm that he exports globally, his, his hay products, alfalfa and, and Sudan and, and Bermuda and Teff hay. And he said, but I'd work all year long to pay my bills. Pay the chemical salesman, get my new tractors purchased, tractor maintenance and fuel. I could get all my bills paid, but there was nothing left for me. And now, as he's making these sales of equipment, and he's starting to see his own pockets start to be filled in a regenerative sense. So my journeys have offered opportunities in so many different ways. And Howard Buffett one time emailed me and says, I got somebody for you. And I thought, what does that mean? So he introduced Doug Tompkins to me. Doug had come to see him at his farm in Illinois. Doug had founded uh, the companies North Face and Esprit. Why was he for me? Well, Doug was an organic farmer also. Howard didn't want, didn't want to deal with that. But Doug wanted to go no-till. He understood. He understood the erosion of soil in Argentina, where this farm is. And Doug had left the apparel industry because he said, there's no way I could make clothes and not damage the planet. That was his sensibility. So he said, I can't do that. 
So he became a billionaire as he sold out, and he and his wife bought huge tracts of land in Argentina and Chile, and created national parks, and negotiated with the governments to donate them to be maintained as preserves, as national parks. They also were breeding jaguars, they were breeding giant sloths, they were reintroducing species that had been kind of lost to most of the areas in a deep commitment to that. But he had a 7,000 acre organic farm. He had a sense of aesthetic, as you can see, not just in clothing, but in his farming as well. Next slide. At a second farm that he flew us to, uh, where they were doing the jaguar breeding, this was a school that he had for his employees that he built. This was a greenhouse. <coughs> it was kind of remote so they could have fresh food. Uh, always a sense of aesthetic with whatever he did. Next slide. This was his, um, well, this was really at uh, Laguna Blanca, that first farm they're showing pictures of. Uh, this is how we traversed from one of his holdings to another in his plane. He loved to fly. And as a passenger, I noticed and photograph at the same time. But anyway, um, be that as it may, that's how he showed me all the erosion going into the Paraná River. Every farm, you saw the gullies, soil just going into the river. Next slide. Again, a sense of aesthetics. This was the office there. So he used recycled wood. He had artisans carve and set up beautiful surroundings and settings. So that was great, greatly appreciated, uh, certainly by me. I love that. Next slide. Argentina has a rodent problem, I would say, because they've lost the jaguars. Just their rodents are a little bigger than ours. As a matter of fact, when we come to a landing strip, uh, it was typically grass-based. We used to have to overfly it a few times to chase them off the landing strip. So that that's a, was kind of a surprise to me. I thought I knew a lot about animals around the world. But that's a big rodent. Next slide. Wildlife abound. Birds that became food. Anyway, next slide. Uh, and part of what he was trying to protect. So, so Doug was uh, dear friends with... Um, Yvonne Chenard at Patagonia, and his wife actually had been CEO at Patagonia. So they, they were mountaineers together. But Doug was an outdoorsman, and about six years ago, he was on a lake in Chile, and a storm came up, his kayak went over, and he perished. Um, so his commitments continue. I'm not sure what's happened to his farm, but in essence, I loved his attempt. He was trying to resolve some of the questions we've been working with. I wished he was still around. He had some resources to do it. Um, and he actually had deep commitment to the planet and the future of the planet. Next, next slide. I'm going to jump now back to India, or not back to, but to India. In, in my life when I was working with a leadership program, one of the things I tried to do was talk about leadership in many different levels. And one was servant leadership. So one of the people, and most of the servant leaders that I met or brought to the table or we went to visit, were not well known, for sure. Some were. I mean, uh, like Valesa in Poland, um, we got to spend time with. But Mother Teresa, I was a couple of different trips to India, was able to have her be present for the group that we brought. And one time we went ahead of time to arrange things. In, in that course of that India trip, we were going to spend some time with Mother Teresa. She was four foot eleven, one of the most soft-spoken people you could ever meet. Seemed to be one of the most humble people you could ever meet. But if you want an example of servant leadership, it was phenomenal. She was iron-willed. She created something out of nothing. She kept getting told no. I remember seeing a priest once when I was there working in the home for the destitute one day. I said, you know, some of our people would like to make a donation to Mother Teresa. I said, you know, is there a, a good way to do that? And he goes, Mother Teresa? And he was a priest there volunteering for a month himself. He said, oh, no, she has more money than God. Find a local indigenous uh, NGO. She was successful as a leader. And she spread around the world the work, of course, post-life. An interesting story was is that once she had said to my wife and I, she said, well, you know where we get our inspiration. She goes, please join us for Mass in the morning at 5 o'clock. 5 o'clock is not a challenge for me. And my wife said, I'll be there. 
And we went up to the chapel upstairs. There were no kneeling pads. There was a concrete floor. And all these nuns were already there on their knees, and so we got on our knees. I didn't last that long, but um, tried to hold with it. My wife had closed her eyes. She's very devotional in many ways. And pretty soon I hear my wife crying. I look over. I said, what's wrong? She goes, I don't know. She opened her eyes, and Mother Teresa had knelt beside her. And she's so sensitive, she picked up on the energy of this woman who was a servant leader at her core. Um, it was, it's always been one of the most difficult things for me to go into the home for the dying and see the suffering, say, how do I attend to that when I want to distance myself from that pain? And to watch a woman who dedicated her life to the poorest of the poor, literally, to the unwanted left in the street. You know, India was a, t a place for me as a Westerner that challenged my internal understanding of life, of structure, of society. When you step over dead bodies in the street, you see discarded people, you think this isn't the way it's supposed to be. In an Eastern philosophy, with a reincarnation orientation, there's a different way of looking at life and a different way of dealing with this. Is it right or wrong? Hard to judge. It wasn't my understanding. It sort of turned my insides upside down. I was trying to reorient, trying to be with it. And I just want to say, you know, I don't believe in reincarnation. I think I did in my last lifetime, though, but not this time. <laughs> anyway, next slide. India, this time in September, comes back to our agricultural conversations. And I showed you a couple of slides the other day. This is a project that I'm blown away by. So with Groundswell International, we were going to hold our strategic planning session with at a facility where this project was going on for us to look at it and to try and understand how it was succeeding so well. So our colleagues from Africa, from four countries in Africa, from Nepal, from four countries in Central America and Haiti and South America, joined, gathered there with two board members, myself and the vice chair, and staff to do strategic planning. But we met with this project leader, and here's the Minister of Ag, who's not leading it, but supporting it. It looks like I'm trying to tell him something, and he's laughing me off, doesn't it? But anyway, probably rightly so. What happened is that they are converting farmers at a rate we've never seen, I've never seen, anywhere in the world. In three years, they've converted 600,000 farmers in the state of Andhra Pradesh with a goal of six million to what's called zero-budget natural agriculture, meaning really no outside inputs. That's what I'd done in Africa, no outside inputs. How does this work? Let's go to the next slide. We ended up, because we were an international group, becoming sort of a media frenzy. It's sort of their, what they called their local CNNs would show up and do camera interviews, and this is Steve Brescia, the executive director of Groundswell some of our colleagues from Africa, and mostly Indian women who are actually adopting this farming practice. Next, next slide. And as you can read, oh, maybe not. Um, we just kept watching, why are we attracting attention? But what we realized, we were being utilized, I won't say used, we were as an international visitor group, were being utilized to continue to promote the work. So we thought, okay. That's positive, and so we supported it and let it keep going. Next slide. But here's the thing that I still have a question about. They did seed inoculation. So I would have said two years ago, and this is really the right thing to do, until our research came forward and said, maybe it's not needed. But in this seed inoculation, Indians are used to working with cows and cow manure, and they used to a lot of them, that was their fuel for their house. They'd make cow pies, put it on the side of the wall, let it dry, and that became their fuel source. But in this case, they're making cow pies for a different reason and adding a few ingredients to it as well. So with this, next slide, they add some pulse meal, they add some cow urine, they add a little clay. You can imagine how it's smelling now because this is pretty fresh manure and the urine addition. It is stinky stuff. 
And they're, you know, listen, I'm a dairyman. I'm not offended by this, but a lot of us are not going to jump in with both hands, are we? But they are. Next slide. And they're going to let it ferment and spend some time uh, curing before they're going to use it as a seed inoculant. Then they will take it with some more clay and they'll roll seeds in it and they'll use that in their seeder or planter. And usually it's, a, it's a, maybe on a tractor, but they're hand dropping the seeds through the tubes and planting it into next slide, into a field they've cleared and tilled. And then that's the last time they till. So they've cleared it and tilled it and then they mulch it. And in this case, they're mulching it with peanut shells. So they're, Dr. Zach, they're keeping the soil cool, trying to keep that biology well, not getting those heat extremes, which we can find in India, very, very simply happening. And then they multi-species plant. It comes back to the complexity of nature. Different root architectures, different root exudates, feeding the multi-species soil biome to make a healthy fertilizing system. And then, as I said before, yesterday, they have cheap labor, sadly or fortunately, and so harvest of the cotton or the peanuts or the cowpeas is done by hand, of course. But this is in a water short area. It's on terrible soil. They're capturing carbon, they're building life, and they're at a zero budget natural project that really flies in the face of Dr. Borlaug's Green Revolution. That Green Revolution has destroyed soils in India, destroyed wells and water. And what's really curious about it is there's revisionist history coming out now. There's been two books and a number of PhD dissertations on it. What I found amazing is three other crops besides the Borlaug wheat had the identical increase in yields in the same time frame. And these authors are basing it on rainfall. And Bill Gates is still pushing piles of fertilizer and GMO seeds. But it looks like nature has figured this out. How do we work with it? How do we figure out how to engage it? Next slide. So we did our strategic planning work. Uh, as a group, spent three days at it. Next slide. Um, I got to one night, spent a little time on the complexity of soil health, soil biology. Most of our, all of our projects were eco, uh, not e were um, ecological agriculture, but there still was a lot of tillage often involved in it. And I came home with a gift. Dengue hemorrhagic fever. Anyway, some of the joys of travel, and um, that's kind of a life-threatening little run. I won't tell you about the follow-up unless you seriously want to know. I don't recommend it. Uh, really, it's, there are other experiences I would recommend in life, but not that. And as we left India with some of our colleagues here that we're working with, we had a, a Brazilian, a couple of Guatemalans, a Honduran, a Malayan, a couple of Ghanaians, and uh, Burkina Faso, those are some of our delegation that were there in this ecological agriculture and now moving towards regenerative um, processes that we have going on around the world. Those are, our, those are the great thing about ground soil and why I'm on, I will serve on that board is we have one of the lowest overheads of any nonprofit. We don't even have an office, but we work with 10 indigenous NGOs to make this transformation happen. Uh, in, in training, uh, information sharing, and now they want to do some research, which is interesting if we can get that funding. Next question. Next slide, please. So ministers showed up, as I said, people showed up, and we left with learning some things. Part of the success of their transition of 600,000 going towards 6 million farmers in Andhra Pradesh is that they actually are collaborating very well with government. And I don't know how to do that, but they're succeeding at it. And we're trying to look at that model and go, huh, where does that have potential? But that's one of the advantages they, they figured out. Next slide. So that kind of takes me to Africa, sort of 
I had a lot of different countries to think about and what maybe to share with you and, and what to think about and, and RN and, and, and um, um, my God, my mind's not working this morning. I'm going to love it when I get sleep. Uh, I've, since Europe, I'm just not getting much. Um, when the request was to talk about this, I said, well, what do you want to hear about? And so, you know, some of your ex really crazy experiences. So that's going to get into some of this too. This was our home. It was really an unpleasant area, as you can see. It was gorgeous. It was over 3,000 feet elevation. There was no malaria. It was a phenomenal opportunity to kind of settle in and do some work. Next slide. Um, it was, uh, Howard had named it Ukulima, and, and he had pulled together four large farms that were contiguous to each other, purchased them, and then he fenced it like Jurassic Park, literally, electrified tall fences. Um, and that was to sort of keep certain wildlife out, certain wildlife in, and a lot of people out uh, for issues of safety. Um, RN, are, RN, are you here? There's Kofi, right? Uh, so you have met and, and know Kofi. So Howard met Kofi in Ghana, and Kofi was, a, it was pretty curious, Kofi had a reputation. He had kind of worked for Monsanto, and Monsanto said no cover crops, Kofi said I quit. And um, he knew from his past experiences that he had to build soil, and he knew no till he had graduated out of Nebraska with a master's that he had to really start to think about how we care for soil for the future. Carried his machete. He's a brilliant guy. He, I talked to him on the phone the other day, and I said, Kofi, we're really focusing on the biology. He goes, I am too, Tim. It's all about the biology. I go, wow. I can't have that conversation with Roland Bunch. I try, but with Kofi, he gets it really right now. And uh, we're working on another project together at the moment. Uh, and um, he's wearing a hat there that says LaSalle on it, because I, I gave it to him. And you know, it's really neat when you have a university that will make apparel for you and put your name right on it. So uh, I appreciate LaSalle University doing that for me. Uh, but he's advertising the Huskies. And what I think is curious is, is that the first time Howard met him, and Howard's asking these villagers, is this guy for real? And they're going, yeah, we're learning a lot from him. And Kofi's watching this, and as Howard gets ready to leave, Kofi says to Howard, go Big Red. Howard goes, what? You know about the Huskies? He says, yeah, I'm a graduate. That cemented the deal, anyway, right there. And, and in essence, Howard continues to fund Kofi's work, although Kofi is so popular now, he has a demonstration farm, Howard's built for him a dormitory. Smallholder farmers come from around the region, and he trains them on a regenerative, highly complex agricultural system. Uh, we were teaching, every year Kofi and I would teach in South Africa at our farm, we would teach seed growers from across the continent and try to teach them about conservation agriculture. Mine termed was biological conservation agriculture, and try and get them to help teach farmers as long as they were selling them seed. Uh, this is my cornfield. When Kofi was there, I let him teach right out of my fields because he was African, and I thought he was going to be able to be a better communicator than I was as an outsider, and, and he loved it. He just jumped in, and he knew everything that was going on. Next picture. Africa is so biodiverse. It's a treat. South Africa is just phenomenal in biodiversity, particularly when you get away from the people. And we lived in a, in a bush area, for sure. Next slide. Um, some, you know, of the iconic animals. Next slide. As a matter of fact, just as those giraffes were there, I was reminded, sometimes I'd jump on a John Deere in, from the main headquarters and drive up to what they called the Pennsylvania Park Farm, where Penn State actually was with some of their grad students, to get a piece of equipment or whatever and come down. I remember one day, open air tractor, driving at too fast a speed. And I was going, whoa, this feels like when I was a kid on a tractor in the Central Valley, uh, and I was just losing myself in the experience until I turned a corner and there were the giraffes staring at me over the fence. I go, yeah, I'm, I'm not in California anymore. It's like, oh my goodness, that's right. Remember where you are. But Howard bred 
and research cheetahs. It was one of the things that he was trying to save habitat, trying to say how do we save species on this planet. Maverick was gentle. He used to be taken to schools until he had a physical malady, and then Howard just took him in. He was a sweetheart. Susan, she was dangerous. One day I was getting ready to go up to the farm for the day to start at 7 in the morning, and I hear on the radio, because the radio was used on the different, from the different farms as sort of a security element, etc. They said, we have some sheep. One, you, has a broken leg. And the sheep were running sort of out in our yard near the orchard. And I thought, a ewe has a broken leg. Something's off here. I went out and got my truck, or as they would say, Baki. I backed down on my carport, looked in the rearview mirror, and the gate between Howard's house and compound behind where this compound was, was open. That's where Susan resided. I thought, huh. So I got out, walked back, look at the footprints, and here's a big cat footprint that had come into our yard area. You, broken leg, went looking for her, and she was over under the corner under a peach tree eating a lamb. And then, in our craziness, we got a bunch of farm crew together and chased a cheetah back to her pen. I don't know why we do these things. Anyway, Susan did run with the lamb in her mouth. Uh, I've never trust her. Howard stopped that effort because cheetahs are declining. They need long ranges to be able to hunt. And South Africa is a cheetah sink, meaning that when they come from Botswana or Namibia or they, they come from Mozambique, the farmers in South Africa shoot them and we're losing them, certainly on the planet, as a species. There's some beautiful things. I'll tell you what, those of you that look for your dung beetles, if you want to see dung beetles, these are B-52 sized dung beetles. You hear them fly by you, they're that big, literally. They're so big, when they smell the fresh manure and they plop down, they just sort of stop their wings and literally fall into it. It's a plunk, and you hear them go by your ears, it's an amazing thing because they follow the sun. I saw one, I, I, I stopped, there was a little traffic, there were some visitors on this dirt road, and I stopped them because I'd gotten out and, and saw a manure ball that was that big, it was softball size. I said, man, that's a dung beetle genetics we don't want to lose. That's a very, very, um, should we say, aspiring dung beetle to take that much manure to bury. But it's a real great system on manure management. And then there's other kinds of insects that we had to learn about called eye pissers that if you were too close, they would shoot a stream of a stinging substance right into your eye. And um, you had to pay attention to what was what. As a matter of fact, one day, I'd gotten bit by something. And I said to my wife, I said, you know, I got bit really pretty itchy. And she goes, you're always getting bit. Just leave me alone. I got other things I got to do. The next day, I was reaching up for something, and she goes, what? I go, what? And there was this whole sack that had formed under my arm. It was almost translucent. She goes, oh, my God, why didn't you tell me? Oh, I thought I did. Anyway, a local said, if those spiders, when they bite you and sting you, your tissue dissolves. And she treated me homeopathically, and it went away immediately, thank God. Next picture. Look at that bug. I mean, we saw, we saw, I mean, this is a fish story for everybody. We had a praying mantis fly in our house one night that was literally this long. It couldn't keep its backside up with its wings. It was so big. We saw species of probably 12 different unique praying mantises. Talk about biodiversity. The species of antelopes, the species of cats. It's just phenomenal. Next. Some are pretty innocuous, and some species, next slide, I'm uncomfortable with. You know, they say not all snakes in, in Africa are poisonous, but you, I swear you could fool me. So the puff adder, it's a short, fat snake. 
It doesn't move like a snake, it moves like a snail. It's slow. It's very dangerous. You go, why? Because it'll hear you coming and it won't move. You step right in it and you're bit. Whereas the cobras, like my crazy friend here, um, they hear you coming and they'll typically move away. So it's not a big problem. The black mambas, you know about black mambas? They're afraid of nothing. They can stand up two thirds of their height and strike, they can outrun you. I never wanted to see a black mama. I got to see one, it got wrapped up in a bush hog. I didn't mind seeing that one, but I didn't want to run into one any other time. I let my farm crew kill any snake they wanted to, even though we were kind of a nature preserve, just because you couldn't have anti-venom. There were two kinds of venom between these different species of poisonous snakes, and if you gave the wrong venom, it was the end. So they say you got to get to a hospital, which was only an hour away. That was disconcerting itself. Next slide. When we first got there, one of the peach trees outside our little house had this green snake clearing out a weaver's nest, and its head looks a little distended because it's full, it's got like three little chicks in its mouth it's eating. It frustrated my wife to see that. She grabs a broomstick and runs out there to kind of stop the snake. I go, wait, 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 wait. We don't know what that snake is. You better not just uh, uh, go after her, and I had to kind of pull her back. Found out it was a boom slang, which again, could have fooled me. This is a very poisonous snake. It's best to stay away from him. Here's the other snake that he and I had a very personal relationship. That's a Mozambican spitting cobra. There were four species of cobras. So one night, middle of the night, it's dark, I have to pee. I get up to go to the bathroom, I don't turn the lights on, my wife's asleep, barefoot, go into the bathroom, I step on something that starts to wiggle like crazy. My lizard brain goes, snake. It's going like that under my foot. My adrenaline, everything's jumping so fast. I didn't have time to think. I had leapt into the bathtub thinking, not thinking, reacting, thinking there's some protection. These are deadly critters. Mozambican spitting cobra is the second most poisonous next to black mamba. So I yell to my wife, don't get out of bed, turn the light on. <coughs> next thing I know, she's come to the door of the bathroom and turns the light on in the bathroom. I go, get back, there's a snake in here somewhere. She goes back, gets in bed, and I'm not seeing it. And I kind of grab a towel thinking I'm going to protect myself, you know, walking out of this bathroom. It's in here somewhere. And <coughs> I'm walking out and I see it has gone behind a trash can under the sink. It's about that big around. And I go, holy smoke. But then I go, well, I don't know what it is. I'm not going to deal with it now. I don't want to deal with it at all. Close the bathroom door. It couldn't get under the bathroom door and said, we'll deal with it in the morning when I go to the farm meeting. I'll have someone from the farm crew come out and get it, which this Texan did for me. He was working with Texas A&M on a project there. And when he pulled it out, we found out what it was. I go, holy smokes. Actually, my wife had gone back to bed. When I closed the door, turned the light off, I went back to bed. She was already asleep. My adrenaline was running so high, I'll tell you what, I didn't go to sleep for hours. I really challenged her on that the next morning. She goes, what? Anyway. These are kinds of things that you wonder how you survive. You know, it's like, oh my God. Well, one of the South Africans had told us, keep your doors closed, you know, keep your windows closed. We go, we love fresh air. This snake had come up a number of steps and come in to eat frogs that had come in to eat insects. You know, it's the chain of life. And I had gotten in the way of this process. I think the only way I would survive as that snake was as afraid of me as I was of it when I stepped on him. Next. So not all wildlife in Africa is dangerous, and some of it's beautiful. I got to see an anteater, which I should have put a picture of. It's one of the most curious animals in the world. It looks like it was designed by a committee. 
really odd animal. And they would go in and go into uh, um, termite mounds and just dig down and, and eat that whole mound of termites, which presented a huge problem for you. If you were on your tractor in your field and you didn't know they'd come in and done that, and you sink a front wheel into it because you're running through your crop and you didn't see it. Um, the, you could always see evidence, but, but one of my friends that had been there four years, he said, you saw one? He goes, I've been here four years and never seen one. They're kind of a rare thing to see. Usually at night is when you can see them. Next, next picture. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful wildlife. Next picture. So craziness, <coughs> boldness, and stupidity sometimes manifest, even in some of us most rational people. First time I went to Africa, Howard was just putting those farms together, and he had another facility with a lot of wildlife. He had a pair of rhinoceros, and we were driving. He says, I want to get back to the house. I want to show you the sunset from up here. And I go, OK. We come around the corner, and his two rhinoceros are kind of in the middle of the road. And he stops. Rhinoceros can tip our little pickup over. Would be no issue for him. We're sitting there, and I know he wants to get up the, to the house. So as an old cattleman, I go, I got this. I jump out of the truck, you know, and I kind of go, yeah. And they leap off the ground because rhinoceros don't have good sight. They don't know what the hell they just heard or saw, and they turned and ran. As I got back in the truck, I go, they could have just as easily charged. I hadn't thought of that. Anyway, stupid. Next picture. We had, um, I've ridden Indian elephants in India, but I didn't know you could ride African elephants. This is one of my sons that come, had come to visit. Next slide. And my wife and, and his wife. Um, great beings. I have elephant stories, elephant consciousness, elephant human relationships, elephant memories, elephant ritual, stories that I learned about these great beings, elephant communication uh, that are phenomenal. Elephants that knew their master had died and walked two days to his home and they'd never been there to be in mourning and left when he was buried. It's an amazing creature that I think we've undervalued for the intelligence, the compassion, the feeling that these beings have. Next picture. Next. I had a warthog issue with my agriculture. Next. These butterflies came through in masses. Talk about a migration. In masses for a whole week, just moving across the fields. And they're not like monarchs where they go back. They go to the end and are terminated. It's, it's a, a really curious migration. Next slide. In our garden, uh, Judalon, my wife, kind of ran, and this is my other son when he was visiting, we ate pretty well. Uh, that was really advantage to having that capacity to grow our own food. She did it biodynamically. Next slide. Whereas here my son and his wife, when we were visiting um, Victoria Falls, were trying some of the local delicacies, which are Mopani worms that have been fried. And this is a delicacy that we were had a gathering where a bunch of grad students were there, and someone from the Congo was there, and there was all this different food set out, and there was a bowl of Mopani worms. And this Congolese walks up and said, oh my God, he goes, I haven't had those in a long time. Do you want some? And I said, no, please, you know, enjoy, enjoy. which is thank you, which really was not, it had to be an acquired taste, I swear. Next picture. I got to, in working with oxen, because one of the things Howard wanted to explore was not just no-till, but could we do it with animal power? And we needed a yoke. And so we had a trainer come from Michigan who actually trained oxen. He had worked in Benin in the Peace Corps with oxen. He had a project in Michigan, a nonprofit, great guy. And he said, well, we got to make a yoke. So he was teaching us, carving it, making it, covered it in butter, let the oxen kind of get used to it. They liked the butter. And yet those oxen were a challenge. Next picture. I had to really modify this no-till cedar from Brazil with row cleaners, I couldn't get good seed contact without row cleaners with my biomass cover crops. I tried to install a GPS on these two guys, and they would not cooperate. So every chance I got, nobody was looking. I got a tractor. Anyway, uh, but we, we worked them. We trained them. We were able to do it. Next picture. 
that was my preferred method. That was my had to do method. Uh, anyway, in trying to terminate a cover crop. Next slide. I always wanted to grow peanuts, as I said before. So my peanut farmer friend here, I told you I had to figure out how to do it no-till, where you have inexpensive labor. That works. Uh, and it worked very well. That was one of my six rotational crops. As a trial experiment, I'd read a book called The Lost Crops of Africa. And to me, I thought in terms of food security, are there crops we've gotten away from because we're too much about corn or beans or something along that line? One of those crops that emerged in my mind to look at was called finger millet. One of the reasons I wanted to try it is that finger millet is so small, it doesn't get insect damage, and it'll store, and it's a great food. So I got some seed from Echo, tiny little seed. I planted them in the sand. Talk about temperature problems in biology. Um, the pivot would come over it, so I knew it would get watered some. I'd go out there, and it was dry and hot. And well, this is not going to work. Tiny seed, couldn't plant it very deep. Pretty soon, I saw these wiggly rows, which looked like a weed. And I go, it can't be a weed. It's not in a row. I mean, it's in a row. And it was this finger millet crop. Next, next slide. It not only did well um, here, uh, it was very productive. It took almost no water. It took the heat stress. It could store forever. And I thought, wow, it is a lost crop. But from a food security standpoint, being able to grow in that much heat with that little water, I even brought some seed home, and I just plant it once in a while to be reminded. These are some of the kinds of things we should uh, probably be exploring when we're talking about climate stress and food security. Are there things that used to be that we could bring back into the system to feed people? Next slide. My system seemed to work. It educated me. It challenged me. It made me think. It made me explore this biological realm because I knew that's where the fertility was coming from because I was putting nothing on the, on the phosphorus poor soils. And I needed to learn. So that's a great gift. And I thank Howard for that opportunity. Next picture. My wife um, is moved by suffering. There's just no question. I remember waking up one night, and she was pacing the floor. And I go, oh, she's fretting about something. And then I knew what she was fretting about, because we met a child in the, in the um, shanty town. And my farm workers were all refugees. We're in South Africa. Who are the refugees? They're Mozambican refugees from political unrest. And they were Zimbabwean refugees from economic um, collapse. And they were the outcasts of a poor village. They lived on the dirt. They had no electricity. They had no plumbing. They had to go get their water. Um, one of their shanty huts. And Judalon realized, because we had a winter there in that part of South Africa, and the winter was dry, they had no real food availability. They had to buy it, and they had no work. <coughs> <laughs> so she had seen some malnourishment, particularly among one child who was dull, non-interactive, has hair turned red, had a swollen belly, and she knew that was a protein shortage and needed, she's a, was kind of a nutritionist, a healthcare worker, an RN, a homeopath, and she knew she could do something. And so some, one of the projects that was growing young Moringa trees, and Moringa has all the 10 essential amino acids in the leaf. So it's a complete protein. And it only takes a little bit as a supplement in food to actually re eliminate protein shortage. So she was trying to figure out what's she going to do, how is she going to get that into this settlement. And she learned she had to go to the mayor, who didn't even live near this area, came in a big Mercedes, and she had to go to the chief, the, the chief that lived within that community. And she got permission from the mayor, and she got permission from the chief if he got the first tree. So she took him the first tree, and then she went in and tried to start to do gardens and tried to get people to plant these moringa trees in their yard. Again, no water in the winter. And they have to haul water for their own use. So 
<laughs> she started to work with some of my workers in their homes, and she got them to start to develop a garden for the winter, which was this project on the left. And the only piece of land that that little settlement made available was their dump, broken glass and garbage. And they began to work on it. Next slide. And she inspired them, and she said she's going to bring some plant starts. And she said, let's dig a hole and find water, which was three foot below the surface. And she inspired children, and basically a, an orange would bring them running. Uh, and they wanted to get the hose and the rakes. Uh, one young uh, uh, child couldn't walk. He would come on his, on his knuckles and pull himself into that garden, across that broken glass, to be a part of this enterprise and this effort. Next picture. And the, this community seemed to be getting pretty excited about it as it started to manifest and show itself. Next picture. Watch out for Chester. He's that guy squatting. He was a, quite a conniver. Brilliant little guy uh, who figured out how to get things. As a matter of fact, there's no electricity in this village. And, and every once in a while when our internet went dead, I go, Chester, he's climbed that tower and he's taken the last solar panel that's been, you know, powering that unit. And we go into the village and there'd be a solar panel, you know, hooked up to something. Um, anyway, I don't blame him one bit. Uh, but I want, want to talk a little bit about this child, not this one specifically. Uh, I have a picture of him later. When she got Moringa into that child, Within a couple of days, that child became interactive and wanted to play. That child got perky, and the whole protein deficiency symptoms began to resolve that fast with Moringa powder. Now, it couldn't come from the young tree she brought, but she brought, had gone to uh, another source to be able to bring that powder into the system and taught people how to use it. Next picture. She was quite thrilled. This is a video. And this was the family that really worked on the garden, and the grandmother, and one of the workers, and some of the kids. Can you activate that? And this is my wife engaging that community. Community, there's life, there's celebration. The garden had been completed. That's the good part of the story. The underside of that story was it was a human community of jealousies. It was a human community of infighting. It was a human community that didn't want to collaborate too well together. Have we ever seen that anywhere else in the world? And in essence, my wife left a little disheartened. Next picture. What happened is, is we were living for four years a life of summers. And what I mean by that is, is that we would go in, in our fall, their spring, to Africa. We would spend spring, summer, fall. Crops were done. Cover crop was planted. Come home that winter, which meant summer. And so we skipped winters for four years. I actually liked that a lot. But in essence, when we came back the next year, Judalon came a few weeks later because she had some meetings and things she was doing in the United States. Kofi had already arrived in South Africa. We were going to teach another class. I'd taken one of my workers back to that community, and I was amazed at what I had seen. So while she was gone, feeling failure, what I saw in the spring was gardens in every little home not just vegetables, but flowers. It was Easter. It was like a resurrection of life and commitment to self-sustaining food for this community. 
She arrives a couple of weeks later, and I said, when Kofi was there, he was staying in the house with us, and I said, Julana, I've got to take you to the village. She goes, no, I do not want to go. I said, no, come on, we've got to take you to the village. Kofi said, Judelon, you have to go. Only because Kofi said it. She said, all right, let's go. Sorry, I'm getting teary, but I'll tell you, did she get teary when she saw the transformation of what had happened? Something had healed in that system, and food was present. Flowers and beauty were present in one of the poorest environments that we could experience or imagine. And that was one of the sort of side things. We were always told to stay out of those communities. Um, Judelon would have none of that. And it felt like uh, something that we don't know the impact sometimes of what we try. Sometimes we have to listen to our hearts and just do and see what will manifest and how it will take. Here's the child that had been malnourished, so healthy, so happy, and scared of white people because I think they look like ghosts to her. Anyway, next picture. One of the things that I want to kind of summarize here as we think about experiences and our responsibilities and our engagement with the world and us as farmers, what does it mean to us? One of the things that I read years ago was a Stanford scientist who had sort of said, you know, environmental impact equals population times affluence, amount of money, times technology. Well, in a technological world, we kind of think technology is going to solve the problem. Did the internal combustion engine solve the problem or create a huge ecological problem? So what we call advancement usually is based on technology, but his point was it's not environmentally connected. It's actually usually destructive. And that's usually true. It's just like um, cryptocurrencies. You go, well, that's inert. You know how much energy maintaining cryptocurrencies takes? It's huge. So it has a very negative impact on something that's only imaginal, doesn't actually exist in reality, you know? And, and that's where that kind of works out. But I want to come to the, the, the population issue. We often say, and I hear people say, well, those people in Africa should have less children. And they should, and they will, when they have more economic capacity and more potential for a future. When girls have more to look forward to in life, like an education, and if the girls could just have an education and an opportunity for something more than just marriage, just the timeline of when they have their first child is increased two, three, four years. That has a big effect on population. But when we say those people, I always come back and reflect on the fact that a Mozambican woman could have 200 children for every one American child with regard to environmental impact. So should we have less children? I, I think so. But one of the things that Judah and I noticed after living in Africa is we always got culture shock. Not going to Africa. We got culture shock coming back to America because of our orientation towards consumption, our marketing. You know, we haven't had a television in 30 years, and a lot of that is to get out of that bombardment of a consumptive consciousness. And that's the culture shock that I've got re subsumed into it being back. And I've got to kind of check myself on occasion and try and step back from that for sure. Because that has an impact on the environment. Me flying here has an impact on the environment. So I want you guys to take care of my carbon excesses, right? But, you guys, you know what has a higher carbon footprint than air travel, which is often looked at as a real problem? Nitrogen fertilizer. So how I eat is also important, too. How I grow my food is also important. Next slide. It begs me to ask the question, where am I of greatest service? And that's the question I came home. I knew I wasn't going to retire. Howard asked me to go run a project in Rwanda. I went and looked at it. I said, no, thank you. I didn't feel that's where I maybe had a, a more impactful contribution. And it's where 
at the Center for Regenerative Agriculture and Resilient Systems at University of California, Chico, at Chico State. I feel that we can make an impact for all farmers around the world as we do this research, as we understand the dynamics, as we begin to show practices, as we hopefully influence policy, as we help us as American farmers help lead this transition globally. And so it seemed to me academia needs to change. I don't like academia, I left it. It needs to change because that's training our future agronomists and agriculturalists and farmers. We have to change our science to be whole system science. We have to change the way we're looking at soil because it can fix the climate. It can fix the water cycles in so many ways. It can fix the food security questions around the globe. And it certainly can start to eliminate the kinds of chemicals that have created 400 dead zones in waterways around the planet. So it seems to me that that's perhaps where my time's best spent until I'm told internally differently. What I appreciate about being with you is your commitment to this journey with us of figuring this out. We have very few years left to make this change, but it looks like there's a roadmap and nature wants to show us that way, it seems to me. It's a delight to be here with you and I'd be happy to respond to any of your thoughts, your questions, your comments um, that you may have with regard to this. But I wanna say, to use that four letter word that RN used at the beginning, with love, compassion, and a generosity of spirit, I think we can make a huge difference. And it is breaking down barriers. It is re-examining our beliefs and our understandings. It is asking hard questions. It's running trials in our own fields. And it is trying to make an adaption that will adapt to the challenges of water in our, in our future of farming, that will adapt to our challenges of soil fertility, that can help feed the world and understand American farmers do not feed the world. That's been a tagline we've been told. But we export 15% of our food and import 10% of it, which means 5% of our food's feeding the world. I just came back from Eastern Europe. I wasn't eating American food. I lived in Africa four years. I wasn't eating American food. We're not feeding the world. Let's not fool ourselves. But we can lead this change. And that's the thing that I think is what we can do together I appreciate all of you sincerely. Thank you very much for the invitation. And I hope this little journey has been more than my personal story, but has actually inspired some thoughts for you, uh, made you reflect on your contributions and what you can continue to contribute. And may we do them together with an open heart. Thanks so much.